All right, Maj, you're on. Great. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Maj Stefan. I am the Opioid Prevention Program Coordinator at the Toledo Lucas County Health Department, and I also serve as the Lucas County Opiate Coalition Lead. And tonight I'm joined by my co-host, Elijah, Elijah Jones. He's the Manager of Treatment Services at the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board of Lucas County. And together we're gonna to facilitate a very important conversation regarding the opioid epidemic. So through collaboration with the University of Toledo Opioid Task Force and the coalition, we've put together a panel of those serving on the front line that are gonna deliver a unique local viewpoint of what the opioid epidemic looks like for Lucas County. So it's our intention tonight that after this discussion, we can continue to provide education to those who are interested and those who are looking for more opportunities to help fight this ongoing issue. Um, and so before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to take a few minutes to hear from Scott Silak. He's the Executive Director of the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board of Lucas County, and he's prepared a few words to kick us off. Scott? Thank you, Maj. First, let me thank the University of Toledo Opioid Task Force, the Lucas County Opioid Coalition, and the Toledo Lucas County Health Department for rising above all the chaos to facilitate this important discussion. Uh, also, I want to congratulate everyone who's participating in this event uh, this evening. It would have been pretty easy just to get home, eat dinner, maybe turn your brain off for a few minutes, but that's not what you chose to do. Instead, you chose to engage in a community conversation about a topic most people in our community would, would honestly rather forget. Uh, the, the opioid epidemic is one of our biggest challenges uh, of our times and simply isn't gonna go away because of the COVID pandemic, right? Um, in fact, I think we can all agree that the pandemic has created challenges for many who are seeking recovery, supporting loved ones in uh, recovery or active addiction, or who are just working in this space of treatment prevention, harm reduction, recovery supports. Uh, I also think we have to acknowledge the health impact that uh, institutional racism and personal biases have had on black and brown communities as it relates to the opioid epidemic. You know, since 2007, the number of deaths for whites have nearly tripled but more than quadrupled for minority populations. This is a tragic fact that we simply have to address. No one unit of government system, agency, person uh, will solve the opioid epidemic on its own. The, complex, the complexities of this wicked problem are well beyond one organization's reach. The problem will only abate through persistent and sustained efforts uh, in our and collaboration. I believe that working together towards the common goal of eradicating this epidemic, we can repair communities, reunite families, and restore individuals. As some of you may know, uh, September was recovery month. It's a time to celebrate recovery. But why do we celebrate it? By celebrating recovery, we support the thousands of individuals and their families who've reemerged from their despair. Recovering from a substance use disorder is never easy. In most cases, it's a daily battle. And unfortunately, as we all know, some people lose that battle. My own family has felt the sorrow of losing a loved one to this epidemic. And I know that many of you have felt similar despair. Despite our loss, I have, known, I have hope in knowing that people can do, people can and do recover, whether it's one day, one year or 20 years, Hope is essential to any recovery plan. People in recovery instill hope in the thousands of others still struggling with their illnesses. Like Recovery Month, this virtual event and the others to come place a spotlight on, spotlight on recovery for others to see and perhaps join in. So I wanna thank you for allowing me to do a quick introduction and I hope that this will be a productive event and productive event for many future times. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Scott. Those are really powerful words and I'm really appreciative that you could also take your time to kick this event off for us. 
Um, so we're going to jump into a little bit of housekeeping first um, and just kind of explain how this panelist discussion is going to work. Um, Elijah and I have curated a couple questions that we're just going to use as um, an idea to help facilitate conversation between the panelists who we'll then introduce um, in a second. But Elijah is also going to monitor the Facebook chat. So if there are any questions that you have at home, um, add those in there and hopefully at the end we'll have enough time to answer some of those. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce the panelists that we've chosen. Um, the first panelist today that I am going to introduce is Courtney Stewart. She works with the Toledo Lucas County Health Department and the Northwest Ohio Syringe Service. Courtney is a licensed social worker and a licensed chemical dependency counselor. She graduated from DGSU in 2007 and is a current grad student at the University of Toledo's School of Social Work. Courtney has been building the local harm reduction movement since 2017 as part of the original staff of the Northwest Ohio Syringe Services. She focuses her efforts on partnering with people who use drugs to further develop syringe service programming and community-based overdose prevention education and HIV and hepatitis C testing. This year, Courtney was named the Lucas County Alcohol and Other Drug Professional of the Year. Next, we have Walter Wenkel from Unison. Uh, Walter is a professional counselor in both mental health and substance use disorder treatment. He has worked in the field since getting his degree in 2011. He currently works at Unison Health as the Director of Recovery Services. Walter has overseen the substance abuse services for Unison for the past year and a half and assists in developing the MAP program. Walter also provides consultation services through Dan Brown Consulting for strategic plan development and new programming. Walter is also a Lean Six Sigma Green Belt. Next up, we have Kesha Valentine, who's with the University of Toledo Physicians Group. Kesha is a licensed social worker currently working as a behavioral health care manager for the University of Toledo Physicians LLC and the University of Toledo Medical Center. In her current role, she identifies high risk patients in need of comprehensive care coordination for behavioral health and substance use disorders. She then works with patients to develop a personalized wellness plan, collaborating with their provider and identified care team members. She also works closely with behavioral health and recovery service providers within the UTMC system, as well as surrounding community providers. Kesha is very passionate about the work being done to reduce the opioid epidemic in our community and has spent time working on the University of Toledo Medical Center's overdose response team. Next, we have Alexandria Thomas from Neighborhood Properties. Alex is the manager of the Wellness and Recovery Center at Neighborhood Properties, the state of Ohio's first peer-run mental health respite care center. As a Cleveland native, Alex is a graduate of the University of Toledo, Go Rockets, and has chosen to call Toledo home for the last nine years, where she dedicated her life to our community and the mental health needs of others. The Wellness and Recovery Center currently employs up to 20 peers who use their own life experiences to help community members overcome challenges while reducing the need for emergency psychiatric or other substance use services. And last but certainly not least, we have Allison Egan, who is a volunteer with the Northwest Ohio Syringe Service Street Team, which is fairly new. Um, and Allison describes her story as the very linear drug use story that we often see affecting millennials. So she started smoking weed and drinking in high school and then moved on to cocaine and pills by her senior year. After graduation, she started using heroin and attempted recovery in her early 20s. But during her late 20s, she relapsed and made the decision at 31 to stop using again. She's been in recovery for three years, celebrating that mark on August 31st, International Awareness Day. Allison has lived experience trying every form of treatment available and some several times, but now she's in a position of strength and wisdom to help others. So she's partnered with Courtney at the Northwest Ohio Syringe Service and volunteers her time as a street team member 
providing Narcan and fentanyl test strips, as well as treatment information and education on opioids to the community. Allison's a Toledo native and a mother to both a 12-year-old daughter and several four-legged friends. In addition to celebrating her three-year mark, this year she'll also be celebrating her wedding ceremony to her loving and supportive partner of eight years, Pete, on Halloween. All right, so with everyone being introduced, let's go ahead and jump in to the fun stuff. Um, so public health experts often refer to the opioid epidemic in waves. It's something that we all hear about um, in our studies and our practice. And the first wave was the increased prescribing of opioids in the 90s. The second wave began in 2010 with rapid increases in overdose deaths involving heroin. And the third wave um, is seen around 2013 when we saw a large increase in synthetic opioids, particularly illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So now experts refer to a fourth wave in the opioid epidemic. And to start this conversation off, I just wanna ask, what does the fourth wave necessarily mean to you? And how do you think that the effects of the fourth wave are seen in our community. Kasha? So the fourth wave to me, what I'm starting, what I'm seeing is um, a wave of poly substances along with the opioid. So um, in my line of work, we're seeing a lot of um, cocaine use along with the opioids. Um, and so we're bringing people in, in treatment and we're treating them, you know, with MAT and things of that nature, but it's, it's becoming more difficult if, if you think about it, because yes, we have medical assisted treatment for um, opioids, but we don't necessarily have that great of treatment for um, some of the stimulants, cocaines and things of that nature. So for me, that's where I see this wave coming in and it's kind of really hitting really hard with the poly substance use and the stimulants. And Kesha, what we're, I, I agree, we're seeing here at Unison even inadvertent poly substance use. So cocaine that has yeah. some form of fentanyl or other drug in it, and we're doing tests with clients and they're surprised that they have an opiate in their system and then maybe they have yes. to get on to some form of replacement therapy when um, that was not their intent in any way, shape or form in the first place or not something they thought they had an addiction to. So they're surprised when they start going through those classic withdrawal symptoms while they're yeah, in treatment. Absolutely, absolutely. We were just talking about this, um, sorry Maj. No. Uh, we were just talking about this at our needle exchange clinic with some participants on Tuesday because um, we were talking about the risks for overdose and what's out on the street right now. And fentanyl is a hard and fast high compared to what we were seeing in heroin. And um, we're seeing an increase in injection habits because the high doesn't last as long and the crash is comparable to what we see common of stimulants. And so people were coming into the needle exchange, you know, when we first started out in 2017, saying they were injecting maybe like four, five, six times tops during a day. And now people are saying they're injecting 10 to 20 times a day. But because the high hits so hard on the fentanyl, the opiate, it can cause a person to nod out and kind of lose a little function. And so they may need a pick me up. And that's why they're going to the stimulant. It was cocaine, it was crack. And now in our needle exchange, we're seeing people come in on meth. And it is an obvious difference in intoxication, the behaviors of someone that's high on meth when they come in to see us, it's very noticeable. It's very uncomfortable. Um, it just looks very uncomfortable too. And so we need to figure out how to talk with people about harm reduction in a different way and maybe offer even fentanyl test strips when we're seeing people coming in using multiple substances. Because when we did a fentanyl test strip study last year, uh, we got some feedback of people who were testing just cocaine and crack, and those substances were coming back positive for fentanyl. So the fourth wave to us that NOS means that the drug supply is poisoned. 
and stimulants are also getting cut with fentanyl and we need to test as an overdose prevention. Yeah, I'm sure Allison has more to add on to this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch a little bit on the, uh, I, I think there's a lot of like, a lot of people are very naive when they use a lot of substances like, oh, there's no way there's fentanyl in my drugs. There's no way. And something that we see a lot when we're out on doing our street team thing is, you know, many people will, you know, if they are using opiates, you know, they, they're like, oh yeah, we'll take Narcan, we'll take fentanyl test strips. And some people would be like, no, I would never touch that. But then we have to educate people and tell them that yes, in fact, that cocaine, methamphetamines, crap, pressed pills have been seen to have been cut with fentanyl. Um, and another thing that, as far as I understand with the fentanyl high is that because it's such a hard, quick or hard, fast high, it, it, they come down from it so quickly that the, they're gonna inject sooner but it has a longer half-life on the brain. So they're more likely to overdose on that end too. So the, the, there's, the opiates are still on the receptors in their brain and they wanna get high again and then they inject too soon. And then that's another way that a lot of people are overdosing. But, um, but yeah, definitely that's something that we're really trying to push you know, to educate people about when we go out is, I don't care what you use, test it. Pills, everything, you know? So yeah, that's just my two cents, so. And in terms of treatment of these of these disorders, and I'm sure Gesha and anybody else, Courtney can probably back me up on this, not to say anything about Alex, I'm sure she knows as well, is the, the treatment's still going to be relatively similar, whether it's opiates or cocaine or any other drug, we're still going to engage them in peer recovery support, we still want them to engage with a sober support group. So while we see these waves coming in, wave one, wave two, wave three, wave 10, the, the big goal is to get engaged in something to help you get sober, whatever that something is, um, whether it be Unison F, Racing for Recovery, NOS, whatever it may be, UTMC, just do something different than what you're doing now. So just because we're in wave six doesn't mean that don't get engaged in some form of treatment. Absolutely. Walter, you kind of um, opened it up for our, our next question. And there's been um, almost in Lucas County, this evolu evolution of treatment services available for people as we've um, learned more about the, the epidemic. Um, but for a lot of people who might not know, what does treatment look like in Lucas County and what are the various levels of care available to people here? So, um, Kesha, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on any of these. I, I, it's a quiz, we didn't know this was gonna happen. Okay, so uh, the first level of treatment is outpatient. So basically you have outpatient and inpatient. Um, inpatient is, I said first, but I'm starting with inpatient. Inpatient is going to be your residential treatment where you go to a treatment center maybe live there or maybe detox. Uh, Kesha at UTMC does detoxification, helps you get uh, the, the drugs out of your system, get to a stable state physically and hopefully mentally as well. Residential outpatient is, or residential treatment is where you would live in a place, uh, your main needs would be met, food, clothing, water, shelter, and they would focus every single day on helping you develop the skills or refine your skills to stay sober. You then have outpatient treatment or intensive outpatient treatment, depending on where you're at. Intensive outpatient treatment is just that. It's intensive. You're going to see treatment providers nearly every day for a couple hours a day. And the purpose of that is not because we just really like to see you every single day, which we do, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is while you were using drugs or alcohol or while the individual was using drugs and alcohol, that consumed a lot of their time, a lot of their day. And so we're trying to replace that with something pro-social or non-drug using. And some of that may be being around other people, learning about how to be sober. And then you get to an outpatient level of care uh, or an aftercare setting where we're looking at how do we reintegrate? How do we start to enjoy being sober? Because a lot of times the struggle is I get sober, but now I don't know what I like anymore because I really liked getting hot and that was kind of my deal. So 
this is where we encourage those sort of support meetings, getting involved in the community, all those things that are going to help you stay sober and then always giving back because when you give it back, that's how you can keep it for yourself. So those are kind of the level of care. And the wonderful thing about Lucas County is we have all of them. We have every single level of care at every single one of our community members can access them. And if we usually play really nice with each other and Eliza, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but if Kesha doesn't have openings, she'll give me a call at Unison. If we don't have openings, we'll call somebody. The main thing is to get you the help you need today because we wanna keep people alive. How'd I do, Elijah? That was great. Um, Allison, I am really interested to hear your perspective on treatment. I think a lot of people watching today have never been in treatment and um, or they might have had a bad experience and you probably had both types of experiences. But I think for a, a lot, especially family members, like what is it like behind those closed doors for people and what can people expect when they go into treatment? Um, okay, so I'll start with the what can people expect and I guess I'll move backwards and you might have to refresh me your questions, but I would say um, it really depends on, I think a big part of it is like what brought you to treatment, like if it was your choice versus if it was, you know, a family intervention or, you know, legal or whatever. But I mean, there's, there's a lot of options, like they were saying in our community that can make detox um, at least not extremely uncomfortable physically and mentally and emotionally, um, which is, I think, for a lot of, um, especially opiate users, the biggest fear is going through withdrawal. And, you know, there's a lot of options now, especially um, that can, you know, medically assisted treatment and whatnot. Um, and if that's, you know, what you choose to do, then that's great. But if you would rather just, you know, do it stone cold sober, then, I mean, that's also your choice. And that's, again, that's still an option at a lot of facilities. Um, but yeah, doing like an inpatient treatment, I mean, a lot of places are going to have the detox and then you're going to, you know, do like the intensive outpatient and whatnot. But yeah, I've done um, pretty much every single <laughs> possible form of treatment there is. Um, you know, some of them stuck for a little while, some of them didn't. But again, I think it's, it really is up to the individual, you know, if they're, if you're there ready to be sober, then you can, you can do it. You know, you just have to have perseverance and be resilient and surround yourself, make yourself a, a, a support system. You know, it's therapy, it's your uh, treatment counselors, it's going to sober support meetings, it's supportive friends and family and things like that. Um, but that's really, you know, the big the big thing I think is wanting it and then, you know, having supportive people in your life for sure. Well, we are so happy that you're here to <laughs> share that information with us. We're really proud of you. Um, Courtney, do you have anything to add about maybe NOS and harm reduction as far as support goes? I think that that's another important piece. Yeah, I was um, gonna add that recovery it does not always mean abstinence. And a lot of people who come into the needle exchange, their intent is to use drugs uh, safer um, and gain access to fentanyl test strips and Narcan to know their HIV and hepatitis C status and to get a hold of sterile equipment uh, because it's been so restricted in the city. Uh, so when our people come in, I mean, one in five people, according to the CDC, go to treatment after they use a needle exchange program. So we are getting people into behavioral health care. But for those that are going to continue to use, uh, they have told us time and time again that they would get more out of just the connection that they feel at NOS or actually serving a purpose by helping another person have access to, you know, new syringes than they would um, getting them for themselves. So they're also looking for purpose and safety and health when they come into NOS. Uh, they may not be focused on abstinence as what they see recovery to be, but they are improving their quality of life by coming into a needle exchange program. They are serving their purpose by doing secondary distribution to their using networks. And that's very uplifting. We've seen people have huge growth over the years. They've come into us uh, very afraid 
avoidant of eye contact, few words, didn't want to take advantage of a lot of what we offered, wanted to get by for maybe a week or two. And as they've continued to come back, they hang for like a half hour. They're picking up stuff for 10 people and um, they're just so much brighter. And you can tell their physical health, just their physical presentation has changed along with their attitude and their mood. Um, and so that's what we focus on, just the small gains to work on whatever the person wants to work on their purpose when they come in. We partner with them on their plan, whether it's getting into treatment and eventually becoming abstinent, we're just improving their quality of life, gaining purpose and improving health. And I think Keisha has something to add too. Yeah. So I also, you know, one thing that I wanted to add to um, treatment and recovery is um, there's also support afterwards. And so I guess I would ask Alex to give a little bit about a little information about what she does because we at University of Toledo Medical Center actually um, use Alex this program quite frequently with some of our people who are in um, treatment with us and who have been sober for um, 60, 90 days, but they're in either outpatient treatment or things like that, and they may have triggers. So maybe Alex can tell us a little bit about how <laughs> they provide those supportive services to us Thank and you. To, the, to others in the community. You're welcome. Thank Thank you, Kesha. I think I was um, not doing the greatest job of jumping in. Like I wasn't, I wasn't hitting my time markers there very well. So I appreciate the segue, but um, I mean, that's exactly. So Lucas County has done a really good job of identifying unmet needs and meeting them um, and continuing to look, look for those ways in which we can get creative with where, with what recovery looks like in our community. Um, and the evolution of peer support has been a really powerful movement that we've seen, um, I wanna say over the last 10 years or so, although peer support has been happening for decades, it just wasn't called that. It had a different name and it looked different. It, it looks like your friend or a family member or somebody in the community helping you to walk through your recovery. That's peer support. That is what we have identified. And in mental health treatment services, it's becoming a, a, a re regular practice to have that kind of service within an agency and, and giving that community member that extra layer of support um, that is relatability, that there's power in, um, you have your counselors that you're working with, you have your substance use counselors that you're talking to, your nurses that you're working with to make sure your health is okay. And then you have your peer supporter that's right there with you meeting you where you are. And you might feel comfortable telling that person, I know I've been working really hard on this, but I really feel like using today. They're gonna understand and they're going to know, you know how to respond because they've walked those shoes. That is absolutely the power of peer support and the evolution of, of serv mental health services and what that looks like. Um, you know, I, in my own professional work, I identify as a peer and there's power in that um, because I think traditionally, as mental health professionals, we didn't talk about our personal life. We didn't dare talk about what negative things we had experienced in our lives. And I think that more people are really open to that, that when you have somebody sitting you know, at the, at the seat in front of you and you're trying to work with them, you can also say, hey, you know, I know what that was like when I went through depression. I know what that was like when, um, when I had thoughts of wanting to end my life or you know, when I had thoughts of wanting to relapse, um, I was also worried about what that would do to my family or if I would lose my job. There's, there's a lot of um, power in saying something like that. And, and at the Wellness Center, that's exactly what we do. And it's that extra step um, where somebody may be in outpatient treatment and working with you all, um, but they're not okay at home. Their home environment isn't, isn't conducive to their recovery at that time and they need a break. So, um, it's, you know, it's, it's just an, an extra layer and another step um, in the evolution of treatment services within Lucas County. Um, and, and to add to Courtney's point about harm reduction at neighborhood properties that, you know, that's our primary focus. You know, we, we center our service or services around housing first. So when someone in the community is having challenges with um, opioid use and substance use, traditionally, you know, that's, that's potential for you to lose your home. That's potential for you to lose your housing. Your substance use isn't gonna stop just because you have that negative consequence. 
Um, and, and furthermore, when you have somebody who is struggling with addiction, if they don't have that housing, if they don't have that safe, stable environment to be in, recovery is 10 times harder. Um, and so housing first, being in the community in Lucas County, it's that harm reduction piece of we are housing you first, no matter what. We're meeting you where you are. You're coming to the table and you may have addiction that you're struggling with and mental illness that you're struggling with. We're gonna give you a, an apartment in a safe place and we're going to walk you through that. We're gonna provide that peer support service and link with your mental health providers and work with them so that we can walk you through it and, and you can remain housed and you can, you can gain that recovery and that path to wellness. That was a great answer. That was great. The whole, all of that was beautiful. I'm so glad you spoke up. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, the fourth wave being poly substance use and different kinds of treatment for everyone and, and kind of like what fits one isn't going to fit another. So I guess if you are a treatment provider and you're dealing with someone with that poly substance use and they only want to stop one substance or they, you know, one of several or several and keep one. Um, I guess, how would you go about supporting that person? Cool. So I could get started on this one. If, if, if I can step in. Go for it. <laughs> um, I think that we as providers, most importantly, we need to raise our standards and keep them high. Um, I think that we need to internally look at what we're providing to our community members and what that service looks like and how is it received. And I say that um, because I think dignified services needs to come. We need to, we need to have those services that are dignified for those community members. Just because someone is suffering with a substance use challenge does not mean that they don't have the right to work through those things in a nice, warm, sophisticated environment and they're being met with a compassionate person. I think above all else, we need to focus on our what we are providing them, what that looks in the room, what does that look like? Um, at the Wellness Center, we worked really hard to make sure that people loved where they stayed and they were comfortable and they had a warm, soft bed to lay in and that, you know, there was a fireplace, like, like Courtney's background, there's a fireplace there. There's, you know, they can look forward and feel safe and comfortable and feel proud of what they're doing. Um, I think we need to put that in the center, at the, at, the, at the center of what we do, provide those dignified services with compassion, um, check our own biases at the door and make sure we're not giving those, you know, giving that off to other people. And if I can piggyback off of that, it, and to Maj's point, it's the client's recovery, not my own. So what I want you to do as a treatment provider is if I tell you what to do, it's probably not going to stick. I don't know about anybody else on the panel, but usually when I get told what to do, I try to tend to do the opposite of it. So if I have somebody telling me I need to stop doing something when I don't want to stop, I'm just going to not show up anymore. So it's really meeting the individual where they're at. What do they want to do? And then if they're doing things that they know are going to harm themselves and they have that knowledge and they have that education, but they continue to make that choice that that's what they decide to do at this time we will be here if they want to change their mind but we will also be here if they decide to continue doing what it is they need to do and still want those supports that we can provide because some sometimes it does work out that they end up stop using all substances after seeing the benefits that they have from initial recovery of i just wanted to stop one and then other times it doesn't but they still see those benefits from stopping that initial substance use or achieving that goal of halting that one substance. So I don't think a pure abstinence only, this is all you got to do, you got to do it my way or the highway, really works in this current setting. Uh, a thought came to mind and I want to get um, some responses from you guys. But Scott earlier was talking about how, you know, we've seen we um, how the opioid epidemic has really impacted the minority community, and this whole talk about harm reduction um, is really a great space to be in. And you know, 10, 20, 
30 years ago, we would not have had this conversation. Um, so I see treatment in evolving and we continue to evolve. But I think back to um, like the, the crack epidemic and how that ravished the um, black community and how the response was um, jail and not treatment. Um, and some people, you know, still feel that way that because um, white people are using opiates that now it's a, it's a mental health problem and not something that deserves incarceration. Can, can any of you talk about how um, we have started to evolve and how we're seeing that, um, you know, meeting a client where they are and providing harm reduction really helps people in treatment? Elijah, I, to, to your point, I think, you know, we have evolved, but I still believe that there is a long, long, long road um, that we still need to go to because we still are seeing that even with um, the evolution, you know, we, you know, black and brown people are still being incarcerated at higher rates for op opioid or any type of drug use. So we still have a very long way to go. Um, and also I would even go so as far to say is we're not seeing as many seeking treatment um, for fear of, you know, things that may, you know, negative things that may happen to them. Um, and then also I think there really needs to be um, a little bit more diversity in some of the treatment. Um, I think we have a lot of black and brown individuals who don't seek treatment um, just because they may not see others that look like them. Um, there are still a lot of biases. There are, there's still, I mean, we have a really long way to go, but that discussion is happening. Um, I sat on a panel a couple weeks ago and this was the very topic and it was, um, there was, folks from all across Ohio and it's 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 a discussion that's happening and I'm I'm so very happy that it is happening because it is it's not just um impacting the white community it's impacting us all um no matter where you're at I mean from the lower class to the middle class to the upper class it's impacting everyone so um, I think that's a great question, and I, I really do feel passionate that we have a very long way to go still. I would agree with um, Kesha in that one of the most important things to um, in impacting the Black and Brown community and, and treatment services and getting access to create treatment services is ensuring that you have professionals that look like us, um, professionals that will understand because, um, you know, Elijah, you're exactly right. Um, I, I even admit that it's, it's a little bit of a sour taste of um, understanding what happened to my people, you know, during the crack epidemic is not happening to another kind of people right now during the opioid epidemic. It's, you know, it, it makes you a little sour. And I think having professionals that understand that, especially when you, there are still people in our community struggling with substances that were a part of the, that crack epidemic that were, that had a substance challenge at that time as well. So um, access to care, I, we can make sure that these communities have access, but if that care does not reflect them in any way, including peer support, having more black and brown people working in peer support um, to share their experiences, you're gonna have a really difficult time tackling that issue because I do still think, like Kesha said, there is a substantial number of people that um, are not even considering services. One, because traditionally and culturally, we just don't do that, you know? Um, but furthermore, the reasons we don't do that are, are things like um, representation and um, what, what that care looks like, what that could mean legally. I absolutely appreciate what um, the Toledo Police Department has been doing, what the Mental Health Board has been doing with the um, crisis intervention trainings for officers. I absolutely appreciate that the work that 
you know, somebody, when an officer approaches somebody on the street that may be using, they're not going to be sending them to jail. They're going to try to get them to treatment with DART, with the DART officers. I think that's a, that is a wonderful evolution of recognizing our mistakes and what we had done in the 80s and in the 90s and evolving from that. But unfortunately, there's still a group of people that suffered from that and are still suffering from that. And how do we, how do we provide the adequate attention and treatment and service to them um, that reflects what what had what they had gone through during that time and what they are still experiencing now. I wanted to talk a little bit about access to care uh, and you know drug policy reform and working with law enforcement and um, what is more acceptable in our community as far as harm reduction. Um, we've been working with DART and the Lucas County Sheriff's Office, the Lucas County Jail for the last few years now to provide overdose prevention education. So people would leave incarceration with an Narcan kit or those who currently work with a DART officer or who have had contact with would have access to Narcan through them. Uh, the expansion through the street team um, offering Narcan, you know, six days a week now through our health department has also created access. Uh, we have a good relationship with um, Toledo Fire and Rescue to identify hotspots to send out our street team to target those high overdose areas to get them Narcan. And we also get tips from the people who come into our needle exchange. Um, but Besides that, we have a person on staff at the Toledo Lucas County Health Department that is focused on getting Narcan out to the minority communities, those zip codes that have um, higher rates of people from, that are uh, people of color. And I would say in the last few weeks, we've been seeing a lot more people of color coming into the needle exchange and we make it accessible to come see us because it's anonymous. You do not need an ID to come see us at the needle exchange to get any of the supplies or testing that we offer, I actually give you a card. So you're gonna have a de-identified card that says you work with the Toledo Lucas County Health Department's needle exchange program to improve your health and that of the community, the public health. And the Ohio Revised Code is written right on that card. So if a police officer were to pull someone over, that card serves as protection on exchange days within a thousand feet of our exchange sites. So that's one of the best things that we can offer people is that anonymity and then a card to say that you're a part of this program um, and we're working with you for support. Um, and we also offer walking clinics. So there's no appointment necessary. We just have windows for people to come in. And um, I would say all the efforts that we put into community engagement and outreach and then the barriers we've eliminated to get people in to see us at clinic and then also to maintain contact with anonymous people through our text alert program. People can give me their phone number. We're actually using the county's emergency response system to send out text alerts to let them know when they can get supplies and where. And if there's an overdose spike, where can you go get Narcan and fentanyl test scripts right now to protect yourself? So those are some of the ways that we're creating access and trying to reach specific communities um, to bring them in. And I would say that the majority of our programming at NOS is um, partnered with the peers who use our services. So we get feedback about what people need. We don't just offer needles and safe injection equipment. We offer pipe covers for people who are smoking drugs. We might expand to safer snorting supplies. Um, so we wanna reach as many people using different drugs in different ways as possible. Um, so people know that all people are served who use drugs because we want to protect everyone who's using with what we can offer our community. Great. So looking forward, what can providers do to be more responsive to the needs of individuals? Eliminate barriers. Um, Courtney, you, you, you really touched on that then there. Um, there's so many barriers to access, whether um, it is applications, insurance, uh, transportation, um, specifically to the undocumented population, social security numbers. We, requ you know, requiring social security numbers, organizations and providers need to eliminate those barriers so that more members of our community can get access and feel safe to do so. 
Um, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in our county. We have um, a, a large immigrant population. Um, we need to ensure that they're gonna be able to be served as well. Okay, so how can friends and family be more supportive of their loved ones? Um, that are struggling with addiction? Love this question. <laughs> I would say one of the biggest things that fam family and friends could do is to continue to love their loved ones, continue to love them the way that they loved them before um, their addiction. That is so huge. And um, because a lot of times people feel isolated from their family, they feel um, like they don't have the support and really educating themselves on addiction, educating themselves on um, the, bio, the biological piece of it, understanding that it is a disease. You know, a lot of times, you know, if a family member has um, diabetes or any other type of disease, what do we do? We want to educate ourselves so that we're able to help our family and our friend, right? So I would say that doing the same with with addiction, educate yourself on it. Edu educate yourself on the treatment um, models that are used. Educate yourself on anything that you can do to help them get through it because they're gonna need that support. Um, one of the worst things that can be done is isolation uh, and, and blaming and things like that. It's really a disease and really understanding the disease process um, is the most important thing that I believe family and friends could do. And if I were to add to that, Kesha, it would be in educating yourself, talk to talk to one of, talk to anybody on this panel, talk to come, I mean, I can only speak for Unison, but come 1212 Cherry Street, I'll talk to you for an hour about what's going on. So that way you, you're getting real information. Uh, there's a lot of information out there that's not necessarily accurate or may have a certain tint to it that yes. it's not unbiased. And so getting information where you know you're, you, it's coming from a professional or it's coming from a professional website, so those that end in .org or .gov, where mm -hmm. you're getting accurate information, the National Institute of Health, SAMHSA, those sorts of resources, so you're not on Jim Bob's blog saying that everybody with this disease is not good or they just, you know, the horrible things that you can read online about people that have this issue. So I would encourage also you got to take care of yourself. So as much as there we want to love the, yes. the addict and we want to support the people in recovery and the people suffering with addiction. If I'm sick or if I'm unable to care for myself or if I'm on edge, I can't take care of anybody else. So I got to take care of me first. And that's really hard when it's your kid. And that's really hard when it's your loved one, your significant other to see them suffer and you just want to help them. But it's super important that it is something that we do. I think, um, Walter, that I, exactly right. You know, while you, you spend so much time focusing on that loved one that's having that's going through that challenge that you you forget about yourself. Um, and you know at the wellness center we welcome so many family members who are um, who have have you know children suffer, you know struggling with addiction or a parent struggling with addiction and they are spiraling and so and I see it so often and you don't know that you need help until you begin to spiral. you know so identifying what your triggers are, working with that family member to establish boundaries, you know, having that conversation um, and, and having that foundation um, for you all to work to work with, um, I think is, is most important. Having patience with your, with your loved one and with your family member um, and really trying to provide support. I, I don't want to speak too much about it, but I know, you know, everyone here as well as the community, you know, we were all tuning into something the other day that involved our election um, that was a mess, but there was a moment there where a candidate said, I am proud of my son and it gave me goosebumps. Um, and I know that it, no matter who you were, you saw that and you felt that 
that kind of love and support. I am proud of my family member, you know, regardless of where they are at in their stage of recovery um, is essential and having patience with them, but take care of yourself as well. Identify what needs you have. Identify where, what your triggers are. If you're beginning to lose sleep, if you're beginning to come to work late, intervene, find an intervention and take care of yourself so that you can make sure you're well um, because you know you can't help another person unless you help yourself. I think that was a really great point, Walter. So with all of that being said, what is something that you wish that friends and family knew? And I feel like each of you might have something to add here. So feel free to take your time and think of that answer. Something that keeps coming up or I keep wanting to say, but I've never find, found a good time to say it. So I guess this will work is it, it, the average, and this stat may be old, but the average person takes around seven times in treatment in order for recovery to take place. And remember, that's an average. So one person could get it on one and one person could take 20 times. But on average, it takes a person seven times. You're changing a learned behavior that has really strong bioneurochemical reinforcements. As much in Initially, it may have been a choice, but as you go along, that choice kind of gets taken away from you by your body. So having that patience with your loved one, with the idea and the concept of recovery that every time they, and I know, again, speaking on me, every time a client walks through that door that may have been discharged, that may have left AMA, I'm just happy to see them back again. I'm just happy that they're alive, that they're here, that they're ready to give another shot. And I would imagine that most service providers are just happy to see their clients come through the door, or if not, they should be, because it's another chance. So please don't give up on your family members. Don't give up on those around you that you love. Um, I just wanted to sort of piggyback back off that as well. Um, you know, and not the average is seven times like, uh, like we stated a moment ago, but you know, some people it might take once, some people it might take 20 times, but it really looks different for everybody. Some people might be complete abstinence, so and they might hit the nail on the head the first time they try treatment. Someone else, it might be a slower progression, and it might not be complete sobriety and complete abstinence. They might, you know, find that they're more comfortable and their lives are better. They're gonna be better in general, but better for them living how they how they want their lives to look and medically assisted treatment or, you know, maybe just, you know, using other substances. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not living their lives better. I think that a really big misconception is that if someone isn't like in complete abstinence-based sobriety, that they, they're not better, they're not improving. But I mean, you can look at, I mean, even if, it's like with any other medication, if you're taking a medication for something and the symptom gets better, that's better, that's what we want to see. And with, I don't know, with that being said, I guess just, you know, harm reduction is huge in that regard, because even if someone does choose to not, you know, base their sobriety around abstinence, we want them to be safe. We want them to make smart choices and we want them to be able to maybe, if that is their choice one day, they want to eventually be completely sober. That can happen by letting them live another day through the safety of harm reduction, so. Thanks, Allison. Um, I want to add more to that too. I think what we need to get across is that harm reduction is not enabling because if we consider it enabling, we're working on the assumption that you can decide what a person's recovery looks like. And that's not true. A person is in charge of their own recovery. It's going to be what they want it to become. And um, harm reduction provides life-saving tools um, to support a person on their journey, which is their own. And um, to add to what Walter brought up originally about how it takes a person an average of seven times to get through treatment before they maybe get to a point of what we're you know, if we're going with abstinence, um, I think there's a lot of people who are quick to, as far as family go, to push tough love 
you know, and I think that's kind of the opposite of harm reduction. And uh, I think we also throw around the term codependency really liberally. Um, and I think we need to get away from that term too. Um, but one thing that I always come back to when I talk with family members, because family and friends are very welcome at NOS too, um, is that when you're talking with someone and they have someone they love that's in active use, they may feel a lot of depression and anxiety and shame and guilt and mistrust, and they may feel isolated. But I also like to acknowledge that the family may also be in that same position, feeling those same emotions, but maybe our society is creating a division between the user and the people who would most likely support them because we're using those terms like tough love and codependency and expecting abstinence. Um, and so we need to really focus on empowering people on their own journey through recovery and then allowing that stigma to fall away for those that would love them to support them the most. I think, um, I, you know, I think Courtney is right. You know, somebody's path to recovery is their own. Um, and what's going to be really important for friends and family is to meet that person when they, where they are and accept them for who they are. Um, you know, we have, we do have this negative stigma um, surrounding addiction and surrounding mental health. And it is scary and it is dangerous. But it, it, you know, it's you, it's it's who you are. It's part of who you are. It's a, it's your path, um, and it's it's your life, and that can be beautiful. And accepting that and working on that, no matter what that looks like, it 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 could take, you know, a, that amount of time to get to some path of abstinence if that's your goal. But you know, accepting your your loved one for who they are and for the challenges that they face loving them anyway, and whatever boundary you set for that, because you do still have to set that. You, you know, I think some family members have said, you know, I, I can, you know, I can love you here, but I may not be able to be as close to you right now um, as I would like, but understanding each other, you know, and, and, and meeting them where they are and walking through it with them and show it, providing that support, because I think that's the most important, and just really understanding them for who they are. Um, you are not just your addiction, you are many other things, you know, many other things that are beautiful, but that is also a piece of you, and that's okay, and, th and that is beautiful, and recovery is beautiful. Um, I, I hate having to plug that all the time. I mean, I guess it's recovery is beautiful. It, well, that was last month, but um, it's it's just really important. And it's also really hard. It's very hard. Um, talking to yourself, reminding yourself of those things, writing them down. You wake up in the morning and you go to the bathroom and you're reading it. Um, just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a journey, but it can be really beautiful. I feel like I don't have anything else to say. You guys kind of said it all. <laughs> um, I I really, wow, like everything I was gonna say, they said. So I just ha would have to agree with everything that um, the other panelists have said and um, just know that we are very fortunate here in um, Lucas County to have so many resources available. Um, and even resources to those who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, I think that sometimes people may not know, you know, if they don't have insurance, oh, I probably can't get help. But yes, there are um, several um, agencies that do, that will provide services to um, our family members and our friends if they don't have insurance or if they're underinsured. So I think that's the only other thing I can add. I think you guys did a great job at kind of wrapping things up. Kesha, I think that is, and I'm sorry, I pronounced your name wrong earlier. I said I was not going to do that, and then I did. Kesha, Keisha, I, I, it depends on the day. <laughs> but I think that's a great plug for the Recovery Helpline. So the Recovery yes. Helpline is a service um, that's 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that connect, can connect people to treatment and can help guide people to the appropriate um, 
treatment, even based on their insurance or the lack of insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's open to anybody in Lucas County. The number for that is 419-255-3125, 419-255-3125, a great resource um, for our community. Um, you guys had some amazing things to say about what, you know, to leave friends and family with. We did have a couple questions in the chat that I want to try to get to before Maj wraps it up. And we've, I've been trying to um, incorporate them a little into the conversation already. And I think you guys hit on, num on a number. We talked about like um, how we can help client best help clients with polysubstance. We, and they only wanted to use, stop using a substance. Um, we've talked about peer support. One question that came in early on was what, what have you, what have you done to better educate the general public on these harsh opiates and drugs when they believe there is no danger? Um, so, and I would add, so what, what could we do better um, as well to educate? And I think um, that's, that's really Maj's thing as the Lucas County Health Department opiate co coordinator. Uh, she got us all together today in order to discuss what's going on with the community and is doing a very good job over the last nine months to continue to raise awareness of this issue. Um, so I would suppose not to speak for Maj, but I would say that, that, uh, that we should stay tuned to where this is being uh, on Facebook, where this is being said, look at the Lucas County uh, website, Lucas County Health Department's website to find more information or contact the helpline, like you just said, um, to get that information that they may need. But I don't want to speak for you, Maj. I'm not really a panelist, but I look to you guys for a lot of that advice. So thank you. <laughs> And I would add, Walter, um, the Opiate Coalition has a Facebook page. So it is a community coalition. And if you want more resources, more education, more information, you know, that is a, something you can like on Facebook and you can get involved in the coalition meetings as well. Um, the last question um, has to do with um, what kind of training is needed to um, treatment staff to increase their knowledge and skill for people who uh, may not want to fully quit or may want partial abstinence or to better manage um, their use. What kind of training is needed for staff to be able to confidently do that with people? I think you have to work on person-centered treatment planning you know, it, the goal has to come from the client or the participant, and you have to work with that to have appropriate measures. What are the best steps to take? I think that's really where it starts. I mean, if you're going to put together a, a stock treatment plan for everybody that comes into the agency, how many people is that actually going to serve? You got to work with people one-on-one -on -one individually. I also think it's a it's a matter of, of harm reduction. You know, if you getting the staff to understand, we may not get this person to completely abstain from substances. And if we continue to try to push that on them um, as our idea of what their recovery looks like, they may not come back to us at all. And that means no treatment for them at all, which is dangerous. Um, I think educating the staff on what harm reduction looks like for your service. So you know, at neighborhood properties, our harm reduction is housing first. We, we make sure we practice that. But, you know, at Unison and treatment services, their harm reduction could, could be something different. So making sure that within your agency, you, ha you have an idea of what that looks like for your, your clientele and that you're continuing to educate your staff on, on how, to, how to work around that model. And I would add in with that, as we educate the staff, we also have to educate the client. So if you're part of uh, MAT program where you're prescribed uh, potentially a controlled substance, uh, that doctor may have stipulations of 
total abstinence in order to continue to prescribe you that controlled substance. Informed consent is very important. You should know that if you're engaging in this program, your treatment plan may need to look like this, but that's not to say that if you engage in other forms of treatment, your treatment plan can't be more client-centered. It really depends on some federal regulations, some local regulations, but I agree with the panel thus far of most of it should be driven by the client, but the client should know, as always, the consequences of decisions that they make. All right. Well, that was great, you guys. I really appreciate you all taking the time to help educate our community and everyone from our community who tuned in to watch this live or will watch it in the future because we did record it. So it'll be up on um, the coalition website. Um, I'm sorry, the Facebook page. So um, if you do want to get plugged in, I want to repeat the recovery helpline one more time. And I think it should be in the comment section as well. But the number is 419-255-3125. Um, NOS, the syringe service, if that was something that you were interested in, they have a Facebook page. The, I think it's called NOS Harm Reduction, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you can also reach NOS, you can reach Courtney at 419-213-2655. Is that right, Courtney? Okay, I did that from memory. <laughs> um, and then the Lucas County Opiate Coalition also has a Facebook page under Lucas County Opiate Coalition. Um, so if you're interested in plugging in and seeing what that's all about, it's really community driven. Like Elijah said, we have a really great collaboration of so many organizations and community members from across Lucas County that are participating to build awareness and um, do prevention. So it's, it's a really great thing to get plugged into. Um, one thing that I wanted to end on really quick was that over the last couple of days, since Alex brought it up, um, after the, um, event, I've seen a lot of positive posts, um, about addiction and, you know, loving someone with SUD, someone who has recovered, um, you know, from people all across the board, I have a lot of friends on Facebook who have loved someone with um, OUD. So um, I kind of wanted to quote one of the memes that I saw. <laughs> um, but what it said was, it's important to hear rhetoric that normalizes substance use issues. And we still have to love, fight, and have pride in people who use drugs. So I want to kind of move forward in this um, with having that in mind. And please get connected with us so you can see more educational events such as this, more topics, um, and just normalize it. So I hope everyone has a good night tonight. Thank you.